Okay. Is this on? Yeah. Okay. Hi. Uh, thank you for sticking around for the last session uh, of this conference. Uh, let's get started. We have a lot to cover. So this is future of infrastructure as code and how to avoid building your own platform. Um, real, real quick, what this talk isn't. Um, this isn't about AWS versus Azure versus Google versus that fourth one. It's not about cloud or, or colo or on-prem or Kubernetes versus whatever. All, each of these options has a massive body of users. Um, there's a good reason that they're um, you know, users. So they're not clueless or anything. We're not going to be getting into any of those choices. Um, I'm not here to push any specific technology just to discuss ideas and ideals. I will talk about my concrete setup, but the ideas are applicable to anything, anything modern. Um, and the topic isn't how it runs or where it runs, it's how it gets there. So the basic postulates of this talk are infrastructure as code is strictly better than manually managing modern infrastructure via web or CLI. Um, it's also that the DevOps model gives overall greater velocity than if production deploy access was limited to operation staff. Um, so this means that software engineers manage their daily uh, operations. So what we are talking about here is the software engineer's interface for expressing how their application lives on the internet today and what other resources it needs, um, and the evolution that it took us to get to good, right? So what is even infrastructure as code, right? Um, this is a definition I lifted off of Red Hat. It's the very first hit if you Google infrastructure as code. But it's basically managing and provisioning of infrastructure through code through a written definition of the configuration and setup of the infrastructure rather than through manual processes like clicking around or issuing API commands. Um, so what's, what's so great about that? Um, it is the ultimate human-readable cloud documentation because it is a file that explicitly says this is how the things are configured. There's no other source where you could go look for configuration. It short-circuits human laziness where we do a thing and then say we'll document a thing and then we don't. Um, and that leads to identical configuration across different stages in, uh, and environments because we do write it once and then we deploy it everywhere. Um, it also provides a reasonable expectation that if something works in dev, if something works in test, it will continue to work in prod. There will be no surprises in the environment of production, right? So when I was first getting into infrastructure as code, 2019, um, this is what the choices were. I don't have to read the whole thing. I'll, I'll, I'll get through it. There's the ancients, um, Puppet, shelf, Chef, uh, Salt, Ansible. They're more config as code, not infrastructure as code. You could abuse them to provision the infrastructure, but they're more meant for I gave you a server, and I want you to maintain this server in such a way. Um, they still have a purpose in the server world. world. If you maintain a fleet of hundreds of servers, then by all means, this is, you know, this is what you'll be thinking in. Um, but with the serverless trends, I think their time is, uh, is running out. So Terraform is the de facto cloud sta cross-cloud standard. Um, it has a massive user base, of course. So as soon as you start looking at infrastructure as code, you're going to end up with uh, Terraform. Uh, the, you, know, you can probably manage your home coffee maker if you try hard enough. Um, the downsides are that it runs locally um, on wherever you execute it, um, and it needs to store the state somewhere. It needs to store, like, here's what I created and here's how it's configured, so that when you change your files, the only thing you're providing is the new thing. It can compare with that written um, uh, record, and you need to store that written record somewhere. Um, it also has, uh, so w also if you're running it in multiple places, if you're running it uh, concurrently, um, you need to be able to lock the operations so they're not um, two processes running at the same time trying to change uh, the same resource in different ways. And the DSL, the language by, through which you express Terraform stuff, is just miserable in my experience. Uh, and in my opinion. Um, the recently, fairly recent, recently launched Terraform Cloud fixes the locking issues and stuff like that, um, but that wasn't the case in 2019, right? Um, cloud formation is AWS's terrible take on, uh, on Terraform. Um, it is a free cloud service, so you pay for the services that you provision with it, but you don't pay for actually using cloud formation. Um, and it has locking out of the box. It will not allow you to affect the same resource with two concurrent processes. You need to wait for the second one. The downsides are that you can only touch cloud um, AWS stuff and that you know, they're lagging behind the actual AWS offering and so on. Um, and uh, you express it with JSON YAML, which is better than uh, custom language, but it's still fairly limited and fairly terrible. Um, 
There was a new challenger um, back in 2019 called CDK from AWS. It was supposed to be a better um, take on the, on the topic. Um, it was still rough around the edges, still not thoroughly tested. We skipped it in that, in that um, iteration. <laughs> um, so we chose CloudFormation because we are AWS native. Um, if, if AWS has a thing we, and it serves us, we use it. So we chose CloudFormation. And uh, this is how we structured it. So I'm not going to get into the super details of it, but I'm trying to paint a picture of what we're dealing with. So there's three stacks, um, roughly, that we need to think about. There's a shared foundation stack that is, there's one of them in each account. And then there's the application stack, and then there's like additional resources like databases and so on. So the shared stack, again, doesn't matter the details, but it's the networking, it's the DNS zone, it's the load balancers, it's the SSL certificate, right? This is what the operations staff deals with. They manage the platform team, however you want to call them. They manage this. Um, and then you have the application stack, which is just the application, right? But it's actually, you know, the task definition, which tells you how to run one instance of a container. Um, you know, where is the image that we're going to run? How much CPU or RAM does it need? Um, which ports does it respond to? Um, where do the logs go? And which envir environment variables you need to configure for it for it to run, right? But it's also the service. Um, ECS is AWS's attempt at uh, Kubernetes-like stuff, so it doesn't matter. But like the service says how many of those containers to run. It says where in the network it lives. Is it then this subnet or that subnet? Um, which load balancer will it attach to? Will it be a private service, a public service? Um, how it's deployed? You know, does it go one up, one down? Does it go 100% up and 100%? All of those things. And like part of the health check config. Not the entire health check, no, part of the health check. Um, and then you have like the target group, which is the thing in which instances register on the load balancer. Doesn't matter. The load balancer rules, like how does the load balancer know that the traffic is meant for your application? Um, the actual log groups, if you want to set, you know, retention, how long you're going to keep your log files and so on. The task role, which is very important, which defines which other AWS services the app your application can interface with. So if you, if you have an S3 bucket, you would add, um, you know, my application can touch that S3 bucket, can do these things with that bucket. Uh, and of course, the DNS entry of how we're going to, uh, you know, connect to our application. Um, in total, the hello world you know, template of, hey, I would like to run a backend application on this platform using CloudFormation is about 250 lines of YAML. How many do we care about of those 250? Like maybe a dozen, right? A dozen? Let's see. Docker image, URL, tag version, whatever. The CPU amount, the RAM amount, how many instances it starts with before it starts like auto scaling and stuff, and which host name it responds to. Five. Six if it runs on a weird port, if it's not the port that we all agreed it would run on. So like half a dozen lines of definition. Everything else is exactly the same. It doesn't matter if you are Java, Python, Go, Ruby, whatever you're under the hood, you're running in a container. You're exposing a port. We're all talking, you know, we're all speaking HTTP these days. So why do we need 250 lines, right? So what's the end result of having this 250 line YAML template that is just to start off? We're not even talking about, like we haven't mentioned, I would like to run a background job every hour. Uh, we're not talking about, I would like to run a background worker that is continuously following a queue somewhere. Uh, we haven't touched adding databases and S3 buckets and queues and all of these things into that template. So it's 250 lines minimum. So what's the end result of having this? It's software engineers just rarely touch it. They avoid it. Um, when they do touch it, they aren't familiar with it, and they don't feel welcome. It's not a welcoming experience to be diving into this file. Uh, it's not a welcoming experience for me who wrote the damn file. Um, they get frustrated understandably and end up hating it understandably. And as the team grows, um, it's simply uh, impossible to keep the level of, of familiarity the same. More people means you touch the infrastructure less often, so less often means less familiar. And you end up with a place where, at a place where people don't really know how to achieve the basic stuff. So we've kind of failed, right? Um, so yeah, I, we haven't even touched how to schedule uh, a recurring task and so on. Each of these problems is at least 50 lines additionally in that stupid YAML file. So, 
and again, like resources. If you want a database, databases are, uh, again, in the dozens of lines. Um, if you want buckets, the problem with buckets is like, is it a public bucket? Is it an encrypted private bucket? Who knows? You have to read the whole block. So um, you end up with massive amounts of boilerplate just getting copy-pasted around um, with very little actual understanding. Like nobody selects 40 lines of some random YAML and says, I understand every, every one of these. No, they say, it worked for the other team. I hope it works for me. Copy-paste. So there's a huge cognitive overhead to parsing each resource's configuration. You're looking at the file. You have no idea what it does. You have to invest time into reading it. It's not, it doesn't read like poetry, right? So let's find a better way. Let's just find a better way to interface with the cloud, not change what happens in the cloud. So this is how we do it. We do ECS instead of Kubernetes. doesn't matter. It is applicable to anything. Let's just find a better way. Um, so I approached this project of let's find a better way with the premise of we need to be more expressive. Like the problem with the CloudFormation YAML is that I can't add two variables together. I can't even have variables for real. Um, uh, String concatenation is difficult. Once you concatenate a string, you can't reference it somewhere else. So if you have to say my application name dot my domain name, you have to do that in four different places in your file. You can't just construct it once and then reference it. So I thought more expressive, we need Python. I'm a Python guy. Um, we need Python or TypeScript or whatever, but like a language and not YAML, right? So nope, nope, mega fail, just a complete failure. So the problem is CDK. CDK is like the new challenger to the status quo, and it was promising to be the solution, right? And it is cross-language. You can write CDK in TypeScript, Python, Java, C Sharp, .NET, Go. Um, it is cross-cloud, kind of. It is primarily, like, it was meant for AWS, and then in version 2, they introduced output plugins, and you can target Kubernetes on bare metal and various things. I consider it to be weaponized expressiveness. It is so expressive that it is a weapon. Um, and ultimately, it still compiles down to CloudFormation and executes through CloudFormation. So you're still constrained by what CloudFormation can do, but it's somehow worse, which is, I don't know, puzzling to me. Um, and the reason why it's terrible is because JSON YAML stuff, right? Um, does everyone know that JSON is YAML? Um, you can, you can, so YAML is like a superset of JSON. If you have a YAML file and then you start a value, you can just feed in a blob of JSON and it works. And it is designed that way. I see you like going like, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's terrible, but it works. So basically, JSON and YAML are the same thing. Um, JSON and YAML has no data types. It is all just either a number or a string or a list of numbers or strings or a dictionary of numbers and strings, but it's numbers and strings, right? So the only way to really evaluate YAML or JSON is to take the entire thing, right? And start from the, fr start from the top and say, the allowed things at the top are this. And then, oh, it mentions this kind of thing. And then the allowed things are, so you're, you're evaluating it from the very top all the way down to the bottom. TypeScript, Python, et cetera, they, because you can, you can create like half a construct. You can feed things around. The only way to evaluate expressive languages is in that moment, in that place where, you're, where it's being constructed. Um, so you have a data type for every single thing. Um, I was thinking of an example, and I'm, I'm going to show you, but I'm going to call it out. That is just mind-blowing. But the upside is it allows for static validation. When you're writing CDK, it instantly tells you you're passing in the wrong thing. Like if it's expecting a network configuration and you're feeding in something that doesn't fully explain the network configuration, it can tell you this is an incomplete network configuration. Um, whereas if you're, if you're running CloudFormation, it kind of, it, it, it doesn't work nearly as well. It can tell you that you're feeding in the wrong value, but once it gets to complex constructs, it gets weird. Um, so it does allow for static validation, but I, I claim that it makes for a miserable experience for the engineers who have to write this thing. So here's an example. This isn't CloudFormation. I'll get to what it is, but it is similar to what you would expect CloudFormation to look like. Um, and this is how we create a DNS record for our application. Um, what we have, does this thing work? Yeah, okay. So what we have is 
<laughs> okay. So uh, we're saying that I would like a C name that um, is valid for five minutes uh, cache wise in this uh, DNS zone that we're pulling in from somewhere else. And it's going to be called my service name dot my DNS zone name. So this is going to be my app name dot my company dot whatever. And then this is what it's going to point to. It's going to point to our public load balancer, right? This is this, so I'm going to show you the same example in CDK TypeScript, which is this, where you can no longer say, hey, here's a DNS, rec here's a DNS zone ID. You have to construct the DNS zone so that you can feed the DNS zone into the record. But it's, it's CDK. It goes to CloudFormation. CloudFormation talks to the um, Route 53 APIs, and they take a DNS zone ID. They don't take a full object. You cannot do it any other way. You have to do it this way. I spent a good chunk of time trying to figure it out. The other thing, and this is the most hilarious example, is you can no longer pass in 300 as like five minutes, which is the universal standard for how we define DNS TTL. We say 300. Everyone who's touched DNS knows that that's five minutes. You have to construct a CDK duration object of five minutes. 300 is not an allowed value. I find this to be very precise and a very miserable experience. So enter Pulumi, and you're, you, might, you might think Gesundheit or, or something like that. Um, but Pulumi is basically, if you, if you went to explain it and I hadn't explained CDK uh, five minutes ago, it's the exact same explanation. The base premise is exactly the same. It's just better in every single way, in my opinion. Um, it's cross-language, cross-cloud, cross-anything, whatever. Um, and it's similar to Terraform, where the software is free and you could use it for free. Um, there's a cloud service that is commercial. Um, I'm not selling you Pulumi. Um, they're not sponsoring me, this conference, this talk, nothing. They don't even know I'm speaking here. Um, and the point isn't Pulumi specifically. It's what we did with it. What I would like is for other people to build similar things that are, you know, I would like to see competition in this space. So I want to show you what's, uh, what's possible, and uh, I hope to discover more tools like it. If you know of something like this, please reach out. Please tell me. So Pulumi is cross-language, and it has the same languages as CDK, Go, TypeScript, uh, Java, .NET, Python, whatever. But in the latest version, they said, we are also doing YAML because they are, um, because it is cross-language, and it is cross-language in a very specific way, which I'll get into. It allows them to completely decouple how you talk about things and what happens under the hood in a really wild way. Um, the Pulumi YAML beats CloudFormation's YAML. In fact, this example this example is Pulumi YAML, where the thing where you just say service name dot DNS zone name, that doesn't exist in CloudFormation. It's a much more convoluted affair. So um, it has variables, which are not a thing in CloudFormation. Um, they don't, the variables don't have to be single values. They can be lists and dictionaries and so on, basic math and so on. Um, it's a 50% reduction in the number of lines against CloudFormation YAML, but we're not here for 50%. Like, I don't care to make a file that is 250 lines, 120 files. I want to make a drastically better engineer interface. So I started looking into custom resource plugins, which is a concept in Pulumi, where you basically can write an entire program that will be called by Pulumi and fed um, variables in. Um, and it's an RPC model where you can write the plugin in anything. They provide SDKs for the supported languages, but you could literally write it in anything. Um, they have pre-built templates for the supported languages, right? And it auto-generates schemas for all of the supported languages. So you could write a plugin in Python and then choose to write your Pulumi stuff in TypeScript and get full, full syntax highlighting, validation, linting, all of that stuff because the schema is published for all languages. Um, the reason why I found this exciting was because of the promise of referencing it from YAML. So we could keep the nicer YAML syntax that is otherwise a good idea, except it's not powerful enough, and build behind the scenes a way more complex um, uh, module for doing the, the, you know, the difficult stuff. So here's the steps that I took. I ported our core template from CloudFormation, which is 250 lines to Pulumi Python, which didn't save me much. Uh, it ended up clocking in around 180. So it's not pretty. It's, it's exactly the same as the CDK. So CDK TypeScript is the same as Pulumi TypeScript. CDK Python is the same as Pulumi Python. The problem is the language. The language is not a good fit for talking about infrastructure. 
Because you would feel weird if it was just numbers and, and strings in Python, in TypeScript. If you were just feet, if you never constructed a single class or a single object to define what it's supposed to look like, the validation would be a mess, right? So you have to go down that route. And when you fall down that rabbit hole, you end up with a mess. So we take the Pulumi, uh, we take the CloudFormation, we port it to Pulumi Python. It is not pretty, but we're about to limit the audience. We're, we're about to make it just the ops team's problem. Um, and we wrap it into a custom resource plugin based on the template that they provide. And then we call it from YAML. And it is amazing. This is the entire thing. This, is, this results in the exact same thing as the initial 250 line YAML template that we started with uh, for CloudFormation. What we're doing here is basically the, f the, first, the top part is just metadata, doesn't matter. Second part is the variables for where our Docker image lives. Um, and where the health check is. The, that, those two are the minimum um, things that you need to provide uh, to get an application running. And then you just call my plugin. This is a fake name, right? Um, you know. um, but you call my plugin. Fargate is the um, uh, AWS service that we actually use, irrelevant for this. But you basically say, I want to create a Fargate app, and I'm going to feed in these two properties. And you're going to get the exact same result as you did with the 250 lines of CloudFormation, where you get log groups and DNS records and load balancer attachments and uh, basic monitoring and alerting and all of these things. Um, and you know, this is OK. We could generate this. I could easily write a thing that takes something similar and generates the 250 line CloudFormation, right? If it's, if it's just two variables, we can easily fix that. But what if you want a database as well? Databases in CloudFormation are a mess because you need to create a cluster. And then you have to create an instance. And you want a cluster of two or three instances. So you need to copy and paste the same block three times. This just, you say, I would like a database. It's an Aurora, again, an AWS thing. I would like a Postgres. Um, and these are my, uh, obviously, we're not going to hard code the password, but just illustrating here. We're going to find a better way to feed in the password. Um, and then you just pass it in as databases main my database. You pass it in, the entire construct. And because we write both of the plugins, because both of the resources are ours, it knows exactly what to do with this. In the background, it creates a secure string where it saves the connection, like the, the username and password, the whole connection details. It feeds that in securely into the application. The application learns about this database from these you know, eight lines of YAML. What about if you need the database to scale up? You change, you add cluster size four, the default is two, and boom, suddenly you have four instances of your database. This takes copy, in CloudFormation, takes copy pasting a chunk of about a dozen lines of YAML and then changing the identifier manually. This fixes it for you. Um, Bet you can't do something smart with buckets. Well, here you go. So we define a private and a public bucket. I have two and a half minutes. Public and a private bucket, and we just give them names. And because it's a public bucket, it is automatically configured to be publicly readable and everything. It's a private bucket. It is encrypted. And then we just pass it in, and you get a connection string you know, for your buckets. And because we only need the bucket name to construct the connection string, you can also just pass in a raw string. But also, it sets up the permissions. So if it's a read-only bucket, it sets up the IAM permissions to allow only the, the application to only read from it. If it's a read-write connection, it's read-write. Um, and you're asking, what about Athena, Redshift, DynamoDB, any service on Amazon, right? We provide the plugin. We extend the ecosystem. We're not limiting anything. The ecosystem is still there. Pulumi still supports millions of resources, AWS, Google, whatever. Um, you can call out to anything. We're not creating a golden cage. We, we're paving a happy path. Um, the mental load of reasoning about application infrastructure for non-operation staff, for people who don't live and breathe this stuff, drops by 99% because the only thing in your repository is the thing that you care about, is what your application literally needs called out line by line. And by definition, if you're looking at the infrastructure, you should be interested in 100% of that and not just the six variables that we're feeding in. Software engineers are still free to experiment. We're not limiting anything. You know, you can you can call out any weird service that you want, and if you find uh, you know a service that the rest of the company would benefit from, we can create a nice wrapper for it. You pave the path. You figure out. You you blaze the path. Um, you figure out how to call it, how to configure it, how to use it, and then we bake it into the company-wide plugin, right? 
One minute to spare. Questions? Okay. Thank you.